Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome our global television audience, which comes to us on C-SPAN and on our own Nixon TV live stream on YouTube. So you are on television tonight. I'm Sandy Quinn. I'm president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. I welcome you to the replica of the East Room here at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California. I ask you to please stand for the presentation of the colors. Please stand. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in this solemn We know the next part. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans, wide with home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Sing it again. God bless America. God bless land that I love. Let's stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with home God bless America my home, sweet home, God bless America, my home, sweet home, my home. 
Please be seated and let's say thanks to the California Honor Guard, the U.S. Army, 40th Infantry Division, Los Alamedo. Thank you, Gary. And also to that great Robbie Brett. He's been singing since he was 14. Now it's no Irving Berlin, but he was pretty good, I thought. Thank you, Robbie. Now I'm going to call upon Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Singleton for the invocation. Lieutenant Colonel Singleton. If you would join with me, would you please bow? Father in heaven, I thank you that we are able to join together as family and friends and brothers in arms tonight to enjoy a wonderful meal, the best fellowship and camaraderie in the world, and your blessing and freedom. I pray that you would continue the work that you have begun in each one of us, for I know you are not yet complete. Thank you that we can celebrate 40 years of freedom. The men here tonight know that word better than most in this world. But even as we enjoy this celebration, we remember another, a number of brothers in arms who went with us into battle and never came home. We remember a number of other brothers who are no longer with us to enjoy this time. We thank you for their lives. We pray for your comfort and encouragement for their families as we join with them in grieving those losses. Father, I know that not everybody comes to you in the same way, but as I come tonight to say thank you for the goodness that you have poured out upon us, the freedom that you allow us to enjoy, your blessings poured out upon us here individually and to pray for your blessing upon our nation. I come in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, sir. And the lieutenant colonel, as you know, is himself a eight-year POW. I want to um, introduce some special guests. I know all of you here are special. You are in our eyes and the eyes of the nation. But I want, to, I want to introduce you to some folks who are very special to us here at the foundation. Let me begin with our congressman from this district. We're honored to have him as the new chairman of the House, the United States House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Ed Royds. And, and of course, our very special guest, our speaker, the great Ross Perot, please stand. And his wife, and his wife Margo is with him tonight. The past chairman of the Richard Nixon Foundation, the Bush-appointed ambassador to Spain, the godfather of Orange County, Ambassador George Arduous and his wife, Julia. The current chairman of the Richard Nixon Foundation, Ron Walker, who served the president in the White House, and Ann Walker. One of the most uh, talented commentators and pollsters and pros on television, Frank Luntz of Fox News. 
your own, your own president of the non uh, uh, POW organization who we worked with so uh, closely over the last few months to put this together, Tom Hampton. And of course, uh, General Chuck Boyd, General. General Mel Spies, the recently retired Deputy Commander of the 1st Expeditionary Marine Force at Camp Pendleton, General Spies. <laughs> President Nixon's Marine Military Aide, Colonel Jack Brennan. I'm pleased that we have several board members here, including former White House speechwriter and advisor to both President Reagan and President Nixon, Ken Kachigian. Our treasurer, John Barr. A close family friend of the Nixons for many years, Marine Nunn. And of course, you know one of your own who's now a member of our board and we're very proud of him, Commander Everett Alvarez. <laughs> Everett, Everett, with that, you gotta run for office, you know? Um, and I'm very pleased and proud to have many members of the Nixon family here with us. And you, um, uh, please say hello to the President's younger brother, the imper he, he looks just like him when you look at him from the side, Ed Nixon. <laughs> the, president's, the president's young grandson, who just returned from a trip, a 10 day trip to China, meeting with China leaders, talking about the Nixon trip of 1972, Chris Cox. <laughs> and the president's daughter, who I'm going to ask to come to the podium, Tricia Nixon Cox. Our hearts are full tonight, aren't they? Forty years ago, on the South Lawn of the White House, under a canopy, that was larger than the White House itself, the President and the First Lady gave a special dinner honoring you and your families. It had rained all day, but as my father later wrote, nothing could dampen the high spirits of that night. We who were there will never forget the moving events of the evening. A chorus of you sang a hymn which had been written in the Hanoi Hilton. The tiny American flag, crafted in secret and at great personal risk, was presented as the colors to a cheer that grew and grew and grew until it filled the canvas tent. The plaque presented by you to my father was inscribed to our leader, our comrade, Richard the Lionhearted. Remember? <laughs> my father in turn called you our true heroes because you exemplify the triumph of the human spirit and the best of America. Under the most difficult of circumstances, you never lost faith in America, and my father never lost faith in you. And when you heard the B-52s you knew you were going home, home with honor. Forty years ago, 
It was my honor to be with you on the south lawn of the White House for an unforgettable evening, which my father recalled was one of the greatest nights of his life, as he hoped it was for you, our true heroes. Thank you for your courage, your steadfastness, and your patriotism, which was an inspiration to so many, including my father, and which will be an inspiration to future generations. God bless you, and God bless America. Ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, so many of you are here tonight, and there are, there are some who are not. And I'd like to call your attention to the screen so that you can see and hear one of your brothers who couldn't be here tonight. Good evening, friends. It's been many years since we had our trials and tribulations in North Vietnam, but it's marvelous to be able to speak with you tonight and tell you how proud I am of you as a group and how proud I am to be a member of the United States military and to have served under a very illustrious leader, Richard the Lionhearted Nixon. So, as you know, that was Bud the Lionhearted Day. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a video, too, from the Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Hagel. Across our nation, Americans are celebrating and thanking those who served in Vietnam. As Secretary of Defense and a Vietnam veteran, I'd like to add my thanks to those silent heroes who went off to war more than 40 years ago. When duty called, they did all that our nation asked, just as generations did before them. Their dedication and selfless service resonates deeply across the country, and their legacy is carried forward proudly by those who wear our nation's uniform today. They helped produce the best military force in our history. Our country will never forget those who fell in battle and those who have yet to return home. We will do everything possible to account for the more than 1,600 Vietnam veterans still missing, and we will continue to heal the wounds of that war. Thank you for your service, and God bless you and your families. Thank you, Secretary Hagel. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Congressman Ed Royce to the microphone. Thank you, Sandy, very much. Well, it is truly a pleasure and an honor to be with you here tonight. Any reunion of the Vietnam POWs is a very special event, but one that is held on the 40th anniversary of the dinner that the President and Mrs. Nixon hosted for you at the White House is truly an extraordinary event. I understand that it is still the biggest event ever held at the White House and I think that that is very fitting. <laughs> Beginning in 1969, there were many pressures on President Nixon to end the war in Vietnam, to desert our imperfect ally, and to trust the humanity of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese to release our POWs, to release you after our troops had gone. But Richard Nixon said that as far as he was concerned, almost everything about ending the Vietnam War was negotiable, but one thing wasn't negotiable, and that was the return of our POWs and an accounting of those who were missing. These were the terms. These were the terms 
of the peace with honor that he stood for, the peace with honor for which you fought so bravely and suffered so courageously. President Nixon expressed the respect and admiration we all felt for you. He said that you were, in his words, like fine steel. He said, these were no ordinary men. These were true heroes. I was looking at the President's memoirs the other day, and I found a diary entry that President Nixon had made 40 years ago tonight when he had gone up to the Lincoln sitting room while some of you were still downstairs at the White House. And this is what he said. As I sat before the fire, listening to the sounds of the music and laughter coming up from downstairs, I felt that this was one of the greatest nights of my life. There were no words then, and there really are none now, that could describe the joy and satisfaction that I felt at the thought that I had played a role in bringing these men back home and that they, who were so completely courageous and admirable, genuinely seemed to consider the decisions I had made about the war to have been courageous and admirable ones. So completely courageous and admirable. That is what President Nixon felt about you 40 years ago, and that is what we feel tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you all to rise, will you please rise and join me in a toast from us and from our nation to the completely courageous and admirable, no ordinary men, true heroes, to the Vietnam POWs. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you notice to my right your traditional missing man table. And to conduct the ceremony, we have Lieutenant Colonel Tom Hampton. Thank you, Thank you Sandy. I'm going to wander from the script a little bit. I had this problem the other day at the swimming pool. I hope you can hear me. This missing man table is symbolic of many things, and typically it's the military but it really is much broader than just the military. In fact, you saw a video of a person who's missing tonight that we would all love to have here, and that's Bud Day and his marvelous wife, Dory. And I personally, my beautiful wife, Margot, is not here, and she spells her name exactly the correct way as Ross Perot's beautiful Margot. And that table brought us together. And Margo and Bud are suffering from the same infliction. And I just want you to know that, as Bud said, Margo is, says, you all have a great evening. The other missing people in this room are 136 of our fellow non-POWs that we've lost since we were returned 40 years ago. So we still have a large number of people, but this table symbolizes, symbolizes them and the 68,000 men and women's names on the wall, and of course all of our current serving military that are, we've lost in Iraq and Iran, or excuse me, Iraq and Afghanistan. The, so the point is, this table is a warrior table, and we're warriors all. Each one of these items on that table symbolizes something that a prisoner of war has suffered. I'm not going to read through the litany because I all pretty much know it, but I, what I will read is just what it is all about. It's set for duty, honor, and country. We toast our hearty comrades who have fallen from the sky and were gently caught by God's own hands to be with him on high, to dwell among the soaring clouds, they have known so well. 
from victory roll to tail chase at heaven's door. And as we fly among them, we are sure to hear their plea. Take care of my friend, check six and do one more roll for me. I'd like to offer a toast and water. To our departed comrades, to our departed comrades, here. And I'd like to offer one more toast to the man who brought us home 40 years ago due to his strong persistence, his fortitude, and his courage in spite of such negative opinions. To President Nixon, hear, hear. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Please enjoy your dinner. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce our keynote speaker is the man who, along with Lieutenant Colonel Hampton, we worked on uh, this event uh, over the last several months. I have to be particularly nice to him because he's a member of our board of directors, Everett Alvarez. Ross, you've always been there for us. You are a true and loyal friend, a personal friend, and we love you. There, and we are delighted that you and Margo could join us, could be with your good friends. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, H. Ross Pearl, come on up. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. And I tell you, you guys just get better and stronger every time I see you, so that's great. I'll never forget when you first came home and we were putting together a plan for a big parade. You ordered and directed us to have that parade in San Francisco. You wanted San Francisco because you had named one of your prisons Alcatraz. A prison, a, a, that was, and that's in, in, uh, this located in San Francisco. And the pilots had fantasized about flying under the Golden Gate Bridge when you came home. <laughs> so in addition to the parade, we had a big cruise boat that took you under the Golden Gate Bridge and by the Alcatraz prison. So that's the best we could do. Now, I will never forget while you were on the cruise boat, you all joined together and just sang your hearts out because you had never been allowed to sing in prison. I'll never forget that. Now, and keep in mind, why were we in San Francisco? You demanded that I put it in San Francisco. And I said, guys, this is a big anti-war town and I don't think it's gonna work. We'll have demonstrators at the parade. We only had one demonstrator who showed up and he was an idiot running up and down by the trolley. <laughs> They're running up and down by the trolley cars that all the POWs and their wives were in and shouting and screaming. Now, without any plan by our group, there was an elderly individual man eating a hamburger with both hands who was standing and watching the cars go by and the crazy guy, the demonstrator, came by him. When he did, he reached down in his pocket pulled out a Coca-Cola bottle and knocked him out. <laughs> and believe me, you guys enjoyed every minute of that. <laughs> Ronald Reagan was a governor then before he was president. 
and we were in San Francisco, and Governor and Mrs. Reagan had a magnificent dinner for all of you at the governor's mansion. And John Wayne was right there at that event also. I'll never forget, that was a really big night. <laughs> I just couldn't resist bringing these things up to you 40 years later, because once again, you've chosen a, Cal a California organization for your event tonight. Tonight, I would like to talk about one of your fellow POWs, a man you all know and respect and think the world of, General Robbie Reisner. As you, most of you know, but some of the people here won't know, he fought in World War II as a pilot. He was an ace by the end of World War II. Then he fought in Korea, and General MacArthur arranged for Robbie to meet China's top ace in the air for an air-to-air -air duel. Robbie did his due diligence and realized he had more fuel than China's top ace. <laughs> Robbie fought defensively until China's ace was running out of fuel and had to turn around to fly back across Korea into China to reach his own air base and land. Robbie followed him across Korea into China and shot him down right over the air base as the ultimate loss of face to China's top ace. Now, classic Robbie, he looked down and he saw 19 planes on the ground. He did a giant 360, came back, and destroyed 14 of the 19 in one pass. I've always given him a hard time about missing five. <laughs> Our president was furious about this occurrence, but General MacArthur supported 100% and protected Robbie. Later, Robbie was back in war in Vietnam and was shot down and he, and he had, and he, uh, before when he was there, he wasn't shot, he shot down a number of airplanes. He's setting the records as usual. Unfortunately, he was hit by a surface-to-air missile and had to bail out. He avoided capture of the Vietnamese for 10 days, but they finally got him. Time Magazine ran a front-page cover story, which I do not appreciate, about Robbie Headline, America's top ace shot down in Vietnam. They knew who they had. They put Robbie in a box for five years, as many of you remember. The temperatures in the box were 140 degrees during the day. Robbie, like you guys, he never bent, he never broke, and he inspired countless numbers of fellow prisoners not to give up using the tap code on the side of the box. You remember all of that, I'm sure. Robbie was brutally treated by the Vietnamese after they learned that he was our top ace but he never gave them any information. And after five years, the Vietnamese decided to let Robbie out of the box and allowed him to live in the camp with the other prisoners of war. On the day he was taken out of the box, all of you, the prisoners of war, arranged a plan to honor Robbie. And they, you and your team members stood and sang the Star Spangled Banner at the dinner that night. And he was in the place where y'all were eating. The Vietnamese stormed in and dragged Robbie back to the box. And after he returned home and I had heard this story, I asked him what was going on in his mind as he, he, they dragged him back to the box. His direct reply with me with a giant smile and a twinkle in his eye was, parole. With those guys singing the Star Spangled Banner, I was nine feet tall. I could have gone bear hunting with a stick. <laughs> yeah. Most of you know, but not all of you know, that there is a nine foot tall statue of General Reisner at the Air Force Academy with a bronze stick at the base. And every cadet that knows that story is certainly motivated, inspired, in terms of what a pilot should be, a um, person in service should be. To further honor Robbie, the Air Force Academy named 
the leadership program for all of the cadets there, the General Robinson Reisner Leadership Program. Now, there's a very large painting at the Air Force Academy of General Reisner getting up into his fighter plane. And it is a great one. And finally, it was so nice, we made sure that Robbie had an identical painting in his home and in the bedroom because he's pretty well bedridden at this point. His wife says that nothing puts a bigger smile on Robbie's face than to look at that painting and think of those days he was flying planes for the United States. Robbie's spirit has never been broken, but he is elderly now and not in good health. Now guess what, my son, I'm a sailor as you know, I went to the Naval Academy, my son <laughs> broke the rules and wanted to be in the Air Force as a fighter pilot. <laughs> now believe it or not, when my son was about to receive his wings, Robbie was there, and it was a complete surprise to me, and he presented his wings to my son Ross, who wears them proudly as you would imagine. <laughs> but time goes on, and now my son Ross, his son, also has gone into the Air Force, <laughs> is in the process of about to earn his wings, we talked to Robbie, and he authorized my son, Ross Jr., to pin the Reisner wings on my grandson, that's Ross III. And that will happen in the near future. <laughs> this will come as a surprise to my grandson, but I can assure you that Ross considers this one of the finest opportunities of his entire life and his entire family, all of us, will be there for that event. Robbie would give anything to be at that ceremony, and I would do anything to have him at the ceremony. But the doctor just said he can't be there. So we'll sure miss having Robbie there to pin those wings on. The Bible says, a real friend sticks closer than a brother, and that pretty well describes the relationship that we stared shared in the pokey. Now that's a statement from Robbie Reisner. Without your support and the Lord, and this is another Reisner statement, I know I would never have made it. Now that I'm on this side of that experience looking back, I can see the things I gained from being there and not that I dare to repeat it. <laughs> Having known true heroes like all of you has enriched my life and made me even prouder of being an American. And I would like to say God bless you for all you've done for our country. Please forgive me for focusing so much attention on just one person. But I know you all know Robbie, and I think that this is a story that will mean a lot to you as it does to me. In closing, I would like to thank all of you again for the incredible things you have done for our country and the incredible sacrifices you have made for our country. And I would like to divert for just a minute to talk to you about, you remember when they shot down the spy plane, the plane flying over China? You, you remember that, don't you? Hold on. We weren't getting anywhere, nothing was happening as far as getting those people out. The whole crew survived, luckily. And so I just impulsively went down, talked to the Chinese ambassador, and explained to him that uh, I understood why they, could be so, they would be so angry, but that I would like to, as a businessman, suggest to them with all the business that our two countries do together, it's not worth disrupting that just over these, this entire crew that has been shot down. We got the crew back. Thank goodness for China. That's a very generous thing for China to do. Here is the spy plane that was sent to me by the crew after they came home. And it's signed by all of the crew members. And I will treasure that forever. But when they came home, 
We wanted to make sure they got the welcome they des deserved. We had a big event out on the West Coast, had a big parade. We had the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders leading the parade. <laughs> but there were several women crew leaders uh, on that crew. Several women were on the airplane. They called me and just chewed me out. <laughs> they said, Pro, we, we wanted Tom Cruise. They, needed, they had a bunch of uh, really, uh, really good guys that they wanted. And I said, well, girls, I'm a, ladies, I'm a, I certainly apologize, and I've learned from this experience. <laughs> but in closing, I'd like to thank all of you again for the incredible things you've done for our country and the incredible sacrifices you've all made for our country. And we are where we are today, thanks to people like you. And I would like to ask the audience who's here tonight to join me with the British tradition of three cheers for all the POWs and their families here tonight. I will say in a normal voice, hip, hip, you say hooray, and I'll say about that, sir. I'll raise my voice. You raise your voice when you say hooray. I'll say the third time around as loud as I can, and I want you to blow the roof off the building. Are you ready? Hip, hip. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. Hooray. hip, hip. I can't tell you, there's nothing I enjoy more than being with you, and I've been able to do it over many years. It's hard to believe when people say 40 years and on and on and on, but time does go by, but you don't ever seem to get much older, and you're all so full of spirit that you're just a role model to all of us in our nation. God bless you all, and keep up your great work. You are our finest patriots. Thank you. I can't, I can't just wait to see you your next big reunion. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats for a moment. There are, there are some people who you've already heard of who couldn't be here tonight who want to be. One of them had a lot to do with your history and feels very strongly about it and wanted to be represented this evening. So I'm going to ask you to look at the screens for Dr. Henry Kissinger. There are very few occasions where one can say where one was exactly 40 years ago, at what time, and in what circumstance. But this is one of the occasions where I do remember it, and all of us who participated in it will never forget it. That evening in the soggy White House of that year was uh, one of the great occasions of the Nixon presidency and an event of President Nixon had every reason to be proud. You were there as former prisoners of war and you had been on President Nixon's mind and on the mind of all of us who worked on this issue in the White House for all the years we had been in office. As President Nixon said on that occasion, that, of, that there is no prouder moment in the history of the White House than to bring you back as former prisoners of war and to celebrate together an event we had long looked forward to. President Nixon threw out a 
extremely difficult period, always took the position that to honor your sacrifice, we had to end the war in a condition that America had not been pro low and that it had lived up to its commitment to its commitments to the people who in reliance on us had cast their lot with us. So that evening of May twenty fourth was a moment of great fulfillment for him and I hope for all of you. You, of course, had borne the brunt of the suffering. And we met regularly with your families, trying to do it once a month. And we were inspired by the courage of your families in uh, holding on and maintaining our principles during this very difficult period. We knew in a general way what you were going through every day. But we didn't learn until you returned the extent and the persistence of what you had to go through. But you held your head high and you put created a condition where President Nixon always felt that he could do no less for the men who had spent often years in captivity. It was a difficult period. And many of those who had engaged us in the war did not have the endurance to see it through, even though President Nixon took upon himself the responsibility for what he considered, and what I'm sure you consider, the duties of this country. So if President Nixon were here, he would tell you how proud he is of you. And as someone who was by his side, I can tell you that I think of the period in which you served with pride and admiration. I'm sorry I cannot be here tonight because of unbreakable uh, commitments. But I'm with you in spirit, and I know that President Nixon could not be prouder than he was on this day because he believed that your sacrifice had made possible to go through a extremely difficult period of American history while maintaining our principles and maintaining the cause of freedom in a distant corner of the of the world. Uh, thank you on my behalf and above all on behalf of President Nixon, whose fortitude brought us to the celebration on May 24th, 1973. Dr. Kissinger is, uh, is uh, 90 this week, and, uh, but he still travels. He went to Margaret Thatcher's services, and he just got back from China not long ago. Uh, but he is indeed here with all of you in spirit. When I looked at the video of the White House dinner, 
I saw that he held it up 45 minutes because all of you wanted to get your pictures taken with him along that canopy. So it's your fault it started, it started late. I also noticed in um, looking at the film that one of the best features of it, I thought, was that chorus that of 35 POWs that apparently uh, 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 wrote the song in, in, uh, while in prison and sang it a couple of times. There were 35 of them who performed at the White House and I caught that uh, on the tape and I want to show it to you. It's a great moment in that White House dinner 40 years ago. Now we will have a special tune by the POW Chorus. 35 prisoners who formed together while in captivity to uh, right, sing to the other prisoners, to pass time, to entertain rehearsal. themselves. In the men's and room at the Statler this afternoon. <laughs> Their special hymn that we did the words the of the Navy hymn. I looking for the music, but I hit it so well they couldn't find it. <laughs> Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Quincy Collins of Atlanta, Georgia, who is the director of the POW Chorus. Well, there were many great moments that night, Irving Berlin and John Wayne, and this certainly was uh, one of them, I think. Now, I know a lot of you are here tonight, so could I ask all the members of that great uh, uh, POW chorus to please stand? Now, all right, is, is Colonel Quincy Collins here? Colonel Collins, come on up here. All of you chorus members, please come up here. Let's see what you can do. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, thank you very much, Sandy. As you saw, th that really was a great moment, a great moment. And as the president jumped up on the stage and came after me, he grabbed me and turned me around. And what has not been told to you is what he said to me. The first thing he said was, Colonel, I expected to hear there are no fighter pilots down in hell. And he said, if you didn't know that, you could have sang Marianne Barnes, Queen of All the Acrobats. She could do tricks that way. Well, you know the rest of it. So. But we didn't do that. Well, as I mentioned there, 
we had to rehearse in the uh, restroom at the Statler Hotel or wherever it was because, you know, when we sang in prison, we had to rehearse in the John. You know, it was just a partitioned off thing. We couldn't sing out where the guards could see us or whatever. So we'd go in there and rehearse. Now, the guys you see up here tonight, I've never seen before in my life. <laughs> and it's probably going to sound that way. But, you know, I, I want to tell you that I started the concept of the POW hymn in about 1969 in a solitary confinement situation. It's amazing what you can come up with when you're in solitary. And between 69 and 71, I put together the words and the music, and I must have changed it a million times, and then I wrote it down on toilet paper to get it in impressed in my mind and when we got out uh, an Air Force sergeant from the band at, at the Air Force s helped me to put all this together. The words are what is important and tonight after you have heard all the wonderful things that Sandy and his group have done for us, if you can place yourself back in those times and those conditions, this is not, this was not written after we got out of prison. This was written while we were there, while we were going through the trials and tribulations that we went through. So I hope that at least if you will listen to the words that we can parlay to you what we're wanting to say. did not have an accompanist the last time we did this, but Ann Green of uh, the Nixon Library staff is going to accompany us and try to keep our butts on key.
thank you so much. That was, that was phenomenal. And to think we were going to book the Rockettes, you, you topped them, so thank you. Quincy, Quincy, we want you back. We'll have you, we'll have you come back to the Nixon Foundation to do some entertainment, all right? Thank you. Now, uh, I'm going to ask the chairman of the board of the Richard Nixon Foundation, Ron Walker, to step forth for a very special toast. Thank you, Sandy. <clears throat> if I could have just, just a moment of your attention, I'd be grateful. As I've said to so many of you, you honor us with your presence. This is a very humbling experience for many of us that have watched while you were there and been with you while you've been home. Many of us have thought about you, we've prayed for you, and it's a pretty special moment to have you at the Richard Nixon Foundation. In making a toast, I'm mindful of a toast that President Nixon made to Winston Churchill in London. He said, good men are few. I'd like to amend it for a moment and say, to many of us, we're good friends. And that is what I'd like to express this evening as I toast and ask you to join me in a toast to the 37th President of the United States, Richard Nixon. Here's to those of us and good friends. God bless. Thank you, Ron. I would like to ask Tom Hampton to come forth and help us close this evening. Talk about a humbling experience. If someone would have told me 40 years ago today, 40 years ago that I would be standing up in front of so many great patriots, telling everyone what a great evening we've had, a great two days, I would have been uh, speechless. And I'm not speechless tonight, but I'm not going to make this very long. All the patriotic words and all the good platitudes are deserved for not only uh, the POWs, but for a, a grateful nation. Few people have the opportunity to experience two things that we've experienced. Time in a communist prison camp and a White House dinner. We're grateful for the experience of being POWs, not because of what it did to uh, many of your bodies. I was fortunate. My body didn't get beat up. But it's what we brought from that experience that I think is the most important thing. And I know many of you give speeches. We need a lot of those kinds of speeches in this country right now. But that's what I focus on, is the qualities that I learned from many of you. And I'm hoping that we all go out and continue to pass them on to the next generation. God knows they need it. It's not totally over, because we're not going to quit. We're never going to give up. Just like we didn't give up in Hanoi, we're not going to give up now. I just want to thank the Nixon Foundation for their generosity in setting up this marvelous event, two days' worth of history remade. And as I say, it, it's been an honor for me to, to be leading our organization in footsteps that started with Bud Day as the first president and many others behind him. <clears throat> And there'll be many more ahead of me, because I think we're going to be around for the 50th. 
And I want all to remember that Monday is Memorial Day, and those are the folks that we really need to honor. I accept everyone's honor for the non-POWs, but the ones who aren't here with us, all at the white table, are the ones that I think we need to recall. I can't remember the quote that, that George Washington said about taking care of the military, but if, if you don't take care of the military, and I'm paraphrasing it, the nation is lost, or something to that effect. Thank you very much for your uh, time, and uh, I am, I've had a marvelous two days, and we've got another day left for our final goodbyes at the hotel. And Sandy, I appreciate all you've done for us. It's absolutely top drawer stunning. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And when you're ready to start talking about the 50th, you know that you can do it here. This is to all of you, your home away from home. Now, before I let you go, I have a special request. We had a request from two fraternities who want to do pictures in their magazines because they're so proud. So do we have any Fidelts in the house? Can you, can you shout out if you do? None? Okay, could I ask the Fidelts, right after this, we're going to take your picture together. So could you come over here in the corner and we'll take a picture and send it to, and then also the Sigma Chi's, are there any Sigma Chi's here? Is that a yes or no? All right, if we could have them come over too. They both called and asked, so thank you. Listen, to all of you, thank you. You are true patriots, great Americans. We're so honored and proud you were here. Please come back. Have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>